Sean McMeekin, welcome to the Inquiry Mind podcast. Uh, thanks for having me on, Stanley. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, so I read, full disclosure, I read most of your book, The Russian Revolution, which is not your newest book. And I got through a decent chunk of your new book. Um, sorry, it's, it's, it's pretty... It's a length. thick book. I it's, a, it's a thick book. Yeah. And it's a lot to get through. Uh, but let's start with your new book. Uh, as I mentioned before, I showed it here, Stalin's War. Uh, well, the first question I want to ask is, when did you first fall in love with history? And what got you on the path to writing history? Well, I suppose um, I was always intrigued by history uh, from childhood, but it was really um, several high school history teachers who kind of turned the light on in me. Um, uh, both in AP American and AP European history, I had um, fantastic teachers. I went to school uh, just outside Rochester, New York in a town called Pittsford. Um, Pittsford Southern was the name of the school. And um, we just had these teachers, they were real characters. Um, Ma Doyle was her name. Uh, Debbie Doyle, we called her Ma Doyle. Uh, she taught AP European history and did a lot of field trips. She would chaperone us. Uh, we did a trip to Europe. Uh, she led the Model United Nations program. Uh, then there was uh, the AP American history teacher. His name was Brian Bell. Um, he's also taught college courses from time to time. He actually did have, I believe, a doctorate in history. So it was un unusual. He was teaching at the high school level. Um, and he was just a real character. He would come to, to class wearing suspenders. Uh, he had a real style and panache about him. He was a Korean War veteran, and so he had a lot of kind of war stories. And um, and in some ways, I kind of modeled myself after him, I suppose, just as far as my, my visual model. Um, I actually used to wear suspenders at times uh, when I taught. I was a little bit younger and thinner than I am now. Um, but so they really turned, turned me on to history, and I suppose in some ways I did model myself after uh, Brian Bell, my high school history teacher. I had some great teachers in college and in graduate school as well, of course, and I learned obviously many things about scholarship. Uh, that's where I learned my languages. I started studying French and German and then Russian. I picked up Turkish a little bit later on after moving to Turkey. Um, but I already had an idea in mind, I suppose, of what I like to do. So some of it was was writing, um, and some of it was actually lecturing and, and teaching. Um, and, and I really do have a passion for both, which is perhaps somewhat unusual. I think people tend to kind of prefer one at least a little more over the other. They tend to be a little bit more of a, a kind of teacher, lecturer, performer, or they tend to be a scholar or writer. And I like to think that I, I have passion for both. Um, and uh, they, do, they do feed off of one another. I think getting feedback from, from both students and also from um, members of the public who come to lecture events or book talks, it's always good to have that feedback because it, it helps to stimulate your own thinking. Um, you also know to some extent what either works or what doesn't work when it comes to writing books. That is to say, it's good to be able to test your ideas off of students or off of people in the audience first um, and see how they respond. Um, but I think originally, yes, the, the inspiration really did come from my high school history teachers. And is there a personal connection for you when you write about uh, World War II, uh, maybe, you know, your ancestry or, or, or is it just because out of pure curiosity? I think it's more curiosity. I certainly did have some distant ancestors, kind of you know, uncle once or twice removed who fought in the war. I don't come from a military family. Um, I think the inspiration regarding uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union comes more from the period of time uh, that I simply lived through. That is the, the time I was growing up. I was in junior high and then high school as uh, Gorbachev launched his reforms, Perestroika and Glasnost. I was in high school when the Berlin Wall came crashing down, when the, the, the thwarted coup or the, the, the failed coup of August 91 happened. So the Soviet Union was kind of omnipresent in the news as I was growing up. I was always fascinated by it. And um, then, of course, the opening up of the archives, the opening up of the country to, to visitors, uh, to researchers, to historians. Uh, there was a uh, there was actually a revelations from the Russian archives. It was a kind of exhibit at the Library of Congress the year I graduated from high school. And, and I went ahead and applied and received applied for and received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to do a research project on um, 
what I call the myth of the Great Patriotic War. I had already been exposed to the more official or orthodox Soviet account of the war, but in some ways I was also exposed to the early critiques of that account as uh, revelations were coming out of the archives. Uh, there was that famous book uh, translated to English as The Icebreaker by Viktor Suvorov. Uh, his real name, of course, was Vladimir Rezun, the Soviet defector who had this very provocative argument about uh, the Second World War. Um, so that as it turned out, uh, it was in the news, it was just kind of uh, in people's consciousness, and um, I really did grow up against the backdrop of all of that. Um, so that uh, that's really where I think the inspiration came from. And then, of course, I, I, I spoke to many veterans of the war as part of that project. Um, I was quite blown away. I was a senior in high school, and I actually found out that that uh, about six Red Army veterans of the war on the Eastern Front happened to live in my hometown. They weren't all Russian, they were of a variety of nationalities, and they all had widely differing experiences of the war in part based on what had happened to them. At least one of them had, had been deported. Um, nearly all of them had been injured in the war, some seriously, several were missing limbs. Um, so for me, it was just a really eye-opening kind of experience, both to do the research and to do the interviews, although so I, I felt the frustrations to not yet knowing Russian. Um, I felt that as the limitations of my ability to really fully understand the story. Um, so I resolved to kind of go back to it one day once I had uh, mastered Russian and, and uh, began to learn how to use and exploit the archives. Yeah. And now to touch on your new book, uh, Stalin's War. I think in some ways it's a very provocative title. Uh, because many people see it as, well, Hitler's war or, you know, the, the war on the Third Reich. Why did you decide to put Stalin in the middle of your book and, well, call it Stalin's war? Well, some of it was, uh, I think it's simply necessary to approach the war from a new and different perspective. Um, on the one hand, you, you could take the title just literally, I mean, this was the war that, that Stalin fought or tried to fight. These were his war aims and his goals in the war and how he and uh, the Red Army set about trying to accomplish and achieve those goals along with the intelligence services and the Soviet foreign office and so on and so forth. But you're right, I am trying to do something a little bit more. I am trying to make an argument, uh, a little bit of a corrective. That is to say, I think that we know plenty about Nazi Germany, uh, Nazi Germany, about Hitler, about German war aims, about the Nazis, about the Holocaust. These books have been have been coming out uh, on a regular basis. I mean, practically um, almost monthly at times, uh, certainly almost every year, something new comes out and they've been coming out now for decades. And so that I, I feel to some extent that the telling of the story of the war has gotten grooved into a certain pattern where um, this tends to happen with history generally. Some of it is that the victors write the history. Uh, in this case, it's the victors writing the history, but with a certain way where the villain kind of gives the story meaning. Hitler obviously being the villain in the story, giving the story of the Allied triumph of the good war meaning. Um, but there have always been some problems with that story, beginning with the lesser understood aspects of what happened on the Eastern Front, the period of the so-called molotov ribbentrop Pact from 39 to 41 when Hitler and Stalin were allies. What happens at the end of the war? If it is a war of liberation, why is it that so many countries fall under a relatively hostile Soviet military occupation, uh, which lasts in the case of Eastern Europe for four and a half decades? Um, if it was the good war, which resolved these problems thrown up by fascism, militarism, uh, revisionism of Germany, Italy, and Japan, um, why is it that so much was left unresolved in places like Asia? Why were there still civil wars being fought in Eastern Europe, in Poland, in the Baltics, in Ukraine, in China, in Northern Asia? Um, was it just a kind of unreservedly positive story? That is to say, um, a story of a triumph of this kind of uh, uncomplicated cause uh, of righting wrongs. Uh, why were so many of the stories of the war buried? Uh, why were war crimes of, of just the kind of one side or one coalition in the war so often spoken of and we learned so little about the war crimes of the other side? Why were whole episodes such as the Soviet Finnish War of 1940, 1939, 1940, uh, the Katyn massacre, which was a huge story in the Cold War, uh, long rumored but officially denied by the Soviet Union, although everyone in Poland more or less knew the, the story and probably in the West people knew the story even though it was officially denied. 
Um, but above all, I think just as far as interpretation, that if, if Hitler, after all, was the, the prime force of the war, the, the catalyst of the war, not just the villain, but that is the person who was actually driving events, why is it that he was, for example, deceased for four months before the war in the Pacific ended? Uh, was Nazi Germany even a belligerent in the Pacific or the Asian War? No. Um, why did the war turn out so perfectly from Stalin's perspective in the end with these vast Soviet gains and territory and influence uh, and war material and booty and slave labor, all these kind of prisoners of war taken into Soviet labor camps at the end of the war? There's a far darker aspect to the war. Um, while one could also say, positively speaking, uh, the Soviets also, of course, did the vast bulk of the damage against the Wehrmacht, and this is something military historians have long known, differential rates of casualties inflicted on the German Wehrmacht and the German war machine. Um, the story of Lendlitz, I think, is also not generally appreciated. That is the, the vast contribution of the Western allies, in particular the United States, to the Soviet war effort. And, and that question, I mean, the, the, frankly, the, um, the entire story that the Soviets told themselves after the war, this is it's not a foundation myth for the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had, of course, existed for several decades before the outbreak of the Second World War. But to this day, this is still uh, the central narrative in the Soviet Union. It's actually stronger than ever now in Putin's Russia. That is, this triumph is what legitimized the first the Soviet Union, the early modern Russia more generally. And it's all based on this idea of this the Soviet version of what we call the good war in the West. And, and the story of lend which for a while was openly talked about the Soviet Union after the fall of communism in the 90s and the early aughts and the early Putin years. There was even a lend museum in Russia and there was a little more humility about the war and about the contribution of the Western allies. That's all being denied again now. The lend museum in Moscow is now closed. Um, so some of it is trying to get at those kind of buried secrets, uh, particularly the ones that you can tell now the Russian government wants hushed up. They don't want to hear about lend um, But I think it's an important story that needs to be told. Yeah, uh, my parents come from the former Soviet Union, and they both, whenever I, I, I would talk to relatives, and maybe it's no fault, uh, through no fault of their own, um, they, when, whenever, you know, you, you mentioned the Americans' role in winning the Second uh, World War or the British role, they kind of, like, brush it off. It's almost irrelevant, um, and maybe that's how how deep the the propaganda kind of reached and they never thought to rethink their opinions or what they were taught um why is it why did the americans support the the soviet union during the second world war financially well it's a very good question and to begin with well, what you're saying about your parents perspective this is of course not at all unusual um russians are not just weaned on this story about the war uh, there's even a kind of hard edge to it that i've experienced in my own conversations with many russians about the war over the years uh, this bitterness about the second front for example that the allies did not want to open a second front in europe or that uh, spam the kind of showcase product of, of american aid to the red army this this kind of processed uh, pork product filled with preservatives um, that was sent over in these vast quantities in these huge tin cans to support the Red Army. They sort of mock this, that spam was your second front where the Russians were the ones bleeding and, and dying and suffering. And there is, of course, an element of truth to that. Again, if, if, you, if you simply look at the casualty figures, uh, both on, on both sides, that is the casualties inflicted on the Wehrmacht, on the German army, and of course the casualties suffered by uh, the Red Army, you'll, you'll often see a figure these days of 27 million war dead on the Russian side, and that doesn't even include all the civilian deaths. So, and then, of course, figures as high as 75, 80, even sometimes higher than that percent of casualties inflicted on the Wehrmacht, at least up until D-Day when Britain and the United States were fighting the Germans, but largely at the margins of Europe, either in North Africa or after 1943 in Italy. Um, but to get to the second part of your question, I mean, it's interesting if you flip this around, of course, the Russians do have a certain shall we say, case to be made that even all of that material and financial economic aid given to the Red Army, that in their view, it was somewhat cynical, that is, that Britain and the United States decided to use the Red Army as cannon fodder, so to speak, that is, 
they were paying them almost as mercenaries to fight against the Germans because they, they were either too cowardly or too lazy or weren't willing to do it themselves. And those arguments really stung. I think Roosevelt felt that personally. Uh, Roosevelt was always at pains, the US president, to, to convince Stalin to try to show him that in fact, the United States was serious about fighting Nazi Germany, even though of course the US would have been well within its rights to prioritize Japan since it was Japan that attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor and not Germany. Um, this lay behind in fact wrote Roosevelt's somewhat controversial rollout of the unconditional surrender doctrine of Casablanca in January 1943. A large part of the reason he announced this when he did was to try to reassure Stalin that the US was serious about fighting. Hitler. Now as to why the US extended these vast amounts of aid, and we're not simply talking about monetary resources, of course, we're talking about everything from the, the famous trucks and Jeeps and Studebakers and motorcycles, even Harley Davidson motorcycles, which gave so much mobility to the Red Army, but even tanks. And the Soviets always poo-pooed these tanks. And they said, oh, well, uh, the T-34 was far superior in its, in its kind of armor to weight ratio. And we also had these heavier tanks, the KV and the later Stalin models. And we didn't need your tanks. That's one of the things that they've always tried to hide. In fact, they did use those tanks. Um, they did use those tanks uh, outside Stalingrad, for example, or at the battle they called Kursk in July 1943, or even later in the, the great offensive, the, the Belarusian and Polish offensive of summer 1944 called Bagration. In fact, on some sectors of the front, as many as 25% or even a third or more of the tanks were actually of US and British, pr primarily by then US manufacturer earlier in the war, such as the Battle of Moscow in 41, it was mostly British. But then you had, of course, all the foodstuffs that were feeding the Red Army. You had the boots, you had the uniforms, the entire Red Army uh, kind of complex for supplying uh, its uniforms and its boots to its soldiers had actually been captured by the Germans in the summer 1941 offensive. Um, you had even inputs for the factories, aluminum, a lot of processed steel products, things like ball bearings, chrome, armor plate, steel plate, uh, vast numbers of kind of machine tools that were needed. So but even cranes, traveling cranes, moving cranes, electric cranes, uh, entire factories, um, entire tire plants and rubber factories, along with technology transfer and patents. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. As to why, again, your question, I, it's a great question. I, I'm still trying to figure out I understand a little bit of it. That is the argument that they needed to keep the Soviets in the war. But what makes that even stranger from the perspective of the US, Britain had already been at war with Nazi Germany for two years, um, well, nearly two years, about 21 months before Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union began on June 22, 1941. The United States was still neutral for the next six months. So the US technically didn't even have to, to choose sides. A lot of it was Roosevelt's own decision and that of his advisors. And one could say they were foresighted. They said even though the US wasn't in the war, the US saw Nazi Germany as an ine inevitable opponent, that they would inevitably have to fight Nazi Germany. Better that Russia stays in the war to keep that front open, particularly while Britain and, and, and Britain's allies, of course, above all, France had been ejected from the continent. Um, the British were fighting in North Africa, uh, the Royal Air Force, was certainly active above, above the skies of Europe, but at the time Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, uh, most of Brit Britain's forces had been expelled from, from Greece. Uh, they had been expelled from Crete, so they were really kind of distant and unable to do any uh, legitimate damage. So there was a strategic argument that could be made, and that was the way it was justified vis-a-vis -vis the terms of, of what was called Lend-Lease, that it was supposedly of a kind of compelling national security or strategic interest for the United States. But it was a slightly dubious argument, not just because the US was actually technically neutral, um, but also because um, after all, I mean, the Soviet Union may be surviving against uh, Nazi Germany in the first year or so might have made sense. But after the Soviet Union repulsed the Germans at, at Stalingrad and particularly after Kursk, it was pretty clear the Soviets were gonna survive. After that, it simply becomes a matter of improving the mobility of the Red Army as it marches on to Berlin. And, and of course, there you had the counter argument that uh, preventing the Red Army from marching west was after all what NATO was later expressly created to prevent. So why, why were the Americans uh, so keen on uh, enabling the, the expansion of, uh, of uh, the Soviet Union and Soviet influence into Eastern Europe? Again, the only person who knows the answer to that is uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the US president at the time. Um, it was a decision that he made and 
he had his own reasons and they're still slightly mysterious. Yeah, I think when we look at history in hindsight, it's always easier to, you know, pick apart, you know, what could have been done, should have, would have, could have, right? So um, one of those situations is, I hear it a lot now, that when uh, Hitler and Stalin were at war, we should have just let, the United States should have just let them fight it out. And then we step in afterwards. Is there, is that a valid theory? Would that have made a big difference? Well, it's, or? it's almost taboo to say it these days. I mean, even for suggesting that the United States had any alternatives other than supplying Stalin's armies full-throatedly and wholeheartedly. Uh, my book has, of course, come in for criticism, although it's quite interesting that at the time, these views were quite mainstream. Harry Truman, for example, the future U.S. president, actually proposed on the floor of the Senate that the U.S. should approach the war like this. If it looked like Hitler was winning, we should aid Stalin. If it looked like Stalin was winning, we should aid Hitler. Uh, this is not entirely unlike the argument that Henry Kissinger famously made about the Iran-Iraq war. It's a slightly different flavor, but when he said we, sh we should root for them both to lose. It's a bit callous. It obviously sounds callous. The fact that it was Nazi Germany and her allies, and don't forget Nazi Germany was not alone. Uh, it was also, of course, Finland and Romania and Slovakia, um, and Hungary, which joined in the invasion. There were also differing levels of support in terms of volunteers coming from places like Spain and Italy that were a little bit less officially on board, but were also supporting the invasion. Um, in retrospect, of course, because of what we know about Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, it seems to be almost an offensive thing to say these days that the U.S. could have actually been neutral in this war. Of course, we know a lot more now today also about many of Stalin's crimes, including those crimes committed during the period when he was allied to Hitler. Uh, again, that someone like Harry Truman would, would propose a, a similar idea shows that people were actually thinking that thought in 1941. There was actually a broad swath of US public opinion. In fact, Gallup did a survey and, she, and they, they showed that a majority of Americans, 54%, this is in July of 1941, opposed the US taking sides so exuberantly and, and sending lots of military aid to Stalin under Lindley's. The fact it was controversial was actually implicitly admitted by the Roosevelt administration because they kept it secret. They didn't actually announce to the public that they had determined Russia was eligible for Lend-Lease aid until November, 1941. So for about five months, the policy was actually carried out in secret. And they actually uh, gave orders to US diplomats um, to keep it secret, not to talk about it in public, what the US was actually doing. So there was a kind of almost implied acknowledgement by the Roosevelt administration, even at the time that it was controversial. In fact, when they did their own public opinion surveys, which were not released to the public, they determined that uh, their policy, that is of giving full-throated, unconditional support to Stalin against Hitler, that this policy was supported in only 11 out of the 48 states, uh, Alaska and Hawaii not then having been admitted to the Union. There were 48 states in what was then still the continent in the United States. And that is they had clear support, majority support in only 11 out of those 48 states. Uh, now, in retrospect, and again, this is what I talk about with the way kind of ideas get grooved over time. Again, later on, this idea came to seem kind of suspect that you wouldn't even voice it aloud that there was any alternative. Now, after Pearl Harbor, of course, things were different. Um, although, in the first place, of course, the US saw Japan as the threat and the priority. And here's where that Russian argument about the Second Front comes to seem particularly suspicious, because of course, Stalin had a neutrality pact with Japan and he refused to lift a finger to help the United States against Japan for the next four years. Not only did he not help, he actually had US pilots arrested. Anyone who crash landed on Soviet soil after bombing raids on Japan, hundreds of them were actually arrested and sent to Soviet labor camps. Um, so there were very strong arguments at the time, which could have been made that at the very least, the US should have applied conditions to this aid, or perhaps should have made the aid um, uh, conditional on the progress of the war. That is to say, so long as it looked like the Soviets were in danger of losing. And that was the original idea behind Lend-Lease, that is to support countries, perhaps if the fall of the Soviets, uh, if a surrender might have then posed a security threat. Uh, but then later on, again, once the Soviets had turned the tide, they could have applied these conditions. Um, so neutrality was certainly an option for the United States. It wasn't an option for Britain because Britain was already at war with Nazi Germany. So to some extent, that version of the story is different. But what's interesting there is that even there, you had a, a questionable decision made by Churchill, uh, Churchill, the prime minister. Um, Winston Churchill um, 
could have actually taken the position, well, look, we certainly support the Soviets in the sense that they're our allies now against Hitler. On the other hand, Stalin had not been neutral when Britain was at war with Nazi Germany between 1939 and 41. In fact, Stalin had been allied to Hitler. He'd been supplying Hitler with war material, including fuel. Stalin had literally fueled the Luftwaffe as it had bombed London, um, along with other targets in the so-called Battle of Britain in 1940. And yet Churchill, and again, some of this was maybe his selflessness or a kind of almost a gallant gesture. He immediately announced after learning of the German invasion of the Soviet Union that, that he would not only support Stalin, but he would send uh, these 20 Hawker Hurricane fighters or pursuit planes, which had actually been pledged to defend Singapore. Later on, he even sent tanks, which had been assigned uh, to Britain's Middle Eastern Command in Egypt, um, along with all kinds of other material which had been sent by the United States via lend lease to Britain, which he then reassigned to Stalin, effectively for free, almost re-gifting these weapons, hoping the Americans would kind of make up the shipments at a later date. And all of this was done at great cost. Britain actually did not finish paying her own war debts to the United States until 2006, whereas both Britain and the United States effectively turned all of this equipment over to Stalin free of charge. There was a settlement after the war in 1951. In the end, the Soviets got off uh, with, you know, as uh, uh, bankers would call it, uh, with a payment, uh, a mere token payment of about two pennies on the dollar, that is to say 2% of uh, what was owed even by you know, the most generous accounting terms. Um, so there, there certainly were alternatives to full-throated support, uh, uh, strict neutrality. Uh, anywhere in between strict neutrality and full-throated support, you could have had any one of a number of interim positions where, where there were limits placed on aid or conditions placed on the aid. In the end, it was all given unconditionally. And in fact, uh, US military attaches and diplomats were not even allowed to go to the front to see how all the equipment was being used. Um, so even that condition wasn't applied. I mean, in the end, it was simply full-throated unconditional support. And there certainly were alternatives to that, uh, well short of strict neutrality, which again might have been the perhaps the most callous alternative, um, or, or the Truman alternative, we might say, <laughs> waiting to see how the war turned out and supporting one side versus the other. In some ways, you might say that's even more controversial than strict neutrality, but it was actually proposed by none other than Harry Truman, US Senator and future president. Yeah, one of the odd theories I heard um, was that Stalin was actually planning to attack first. and. I don't know if there's any evidence to that because, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, again, this is a, one of those I heard theories. So that he had a lot of um, tanks and uh, other ammunition at the, at the border, um, and he was planning to strike first against the Germans. Is there any evidence to that or, or no? Well, this is the so-called Sivorov thesis. I mean, it's a it's a slightly sticky question because first of all, no, there is no, I mean, to answer the most simple way possible, no, we don't have any evidence of an imminent Soviet attack. That is to say, there wasn't a kind of a launch date where they were ready to go by a certain date in July or August, 1941. Certain dates have been proposed, that is theories on when Stalin might have been thinking about launching an attack. What we do have, in addition to the evidence of, of the deployment, and that part is true, that is that the Soviets were deploying massive numbers of warplanes, including the kind of light bombers, the so-called clear sky bombers, the kind that might be used if, effectively because they weren't fighters, they also weren't long range bombers, effectively they were designed to support infantry and in uncontested air. Uh, the, the German version of this, the JU-87, the so-called Stuka dive bomber, there was the Japanese Nakajima, the kind used at Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Soviets had their own versions of these, and yes, they were building lots of them. They did have them, and they were deploying them in these new air bases. They're building new air bases on the German frontier. I mean, that, that kind of evidence we do have now. We know that, for example, of, of 251 new aerodromes, or that is to say air bases being built in the first six months of 1941, that 199 of them, effectively 200, almost exactly 80%, give or take a percentage point, maybe 79% technically, uh, were being built in frontier districts, that is within a few minutes flying distance of the Reich, uh, along with, of course, many, um, uh, many tanks, tank parks, petrol stations, all of that. The military buildup was real. That doesn't mean we know exactly what Stalin was intending. Uh, the other type of evidence we have, um, some of it has to do with uh, the calling up of reserves in June 1941, which again is not really conclusive one way or the other. There was a lot of chatter about, of course, 
the German military buildup on the other side of the frontier, German surveillance over flights. So it doesn't necessarily tell us much that the Soviets were calling up reserves. There definitely was a shifting of troops along with all the armor I talked about to the border. We do know about war games conducted by uh, the Soviet generals under the supervision of the Politburo and Stalin uh, in January 1941, which did war game out the possibility of an attack. But the idea was a little bit more like when the Germans had mobilized for an attack, this would be a counterattack. So the timing, again, it's a little sticky. It's not clear who was actually going to strike first. There were then updated mobilization and war plans, both in March and uh, as late as the 15th of May 1941, where we now have kind of rudimentary files on what those plans were. Uh, the one in May did, did talk for the first time of the need to, as, as the Russian phrase would have, the protivnika, forestall the adversary, which is not necessarily to say strike first. It's a little bit more like the idea that if the Germans are, are in the process of mobilizing and preparing for attack, we will disrupt that attack. Perhaps preempt it. They didn't use the word preempt literally. It might be implied in the phrase forestall the adversary. There's definitely a lot of evidence of much more aggressive language, both uh, there's a speech Stalin gives uh, to military academy graduates on the 5th of May, 1941. There are new, um, uh, there's new language being used in the kind of political indoctrination center uh, uh, sessions, the so-called commissars or politbrooks. They're talking about the offensive. They're talking about an offensive spirit. So there's a lot of this kind of evidence suggesting they were preparing for war. Um, as far as what they were expecting, we don't know exactly. It could have been, again, that they thought the Germans were preparing to attack and they would counterattack. Uh, there seems to have been a little bit of a naive assumption that if the Germans did prepare an attack, that it would be telegraphed, so the Soviets would have time to prepare their own counter strike, or as the phrase had it, the, the centerpiece of the Soviet military planning. Most of the armors on the southwestern front facing from Ukraine, where some of it could have gone kind of to the southwest of Romania, some of it um, more northwest into Poland. And the centerpiece was supposed to be what they called a powerful strike in the direction of Lublin, this being a city in, um, you know, in what was now kind of German occupied Poland. Um, so that the idea again was that the Soviets would be able to either have a counter attack or counter strike. Uh, in practice, of course, it didn't happen. In practice, it was the Germans who struck first and any Soviet effort to counterattack, and they did issue orders to counterattack. I mean, that, that powerful strike in the direction of Lublin, they did order it. Stalin did order it. Uh, it didn't happen, of course, because the Germans effectively had smothered any possible Russian counteroffensive with the speed of their own advance. Um, so the evidence, it's ambiguous. Um, there's definitely no direct evidence of any Soviet plan to attack on a specific date. There is a lot of evidence of Soviet military preparations stepping up. Um, and there definitely was evidence of uh, more aggressive Soviet war gaming and war planning. Um, but in the end, um, it's simply unresolved. We simply don't know. There's a lot of material that's still missing. We know about certain days when Stalin met with his military chiefs. We don't know what they said. Um, we don't know what they were expecting. We don't know what they were planning. Whatever they were planning um, seems to have been either ruined or, um, I, I don't know if preempted is the right word, but certainly the German attack uh, through a major wrench into Soviet plans, whatever they were, and uh, they obviously had to kind of go back to the drawing board and start over. Yeah. Um, do Americans have a, do Americans misunderstand Stalin's impact on the war? Because I think there's part of the population that views Stalin as, you know, one of the, on the right side, I guess, uh, during the war. And the other side that goes, well, yes, but look at the atrocities he committed before the war, during the war, and then after the war. So um, does, does he still have like a, a hero complex or that he's not supposed to have? And how do we misunderstand him now that we can maybe remedy going forward? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, to begin with, of course, things are very different in the way Russians remember the war. Ukrainians remember the war, Poles remember the war, Americans, Britons, we all have certain different things that we emphasize. And uh, it's true that generally speaking, um, the US story of the war focuses a lot more on the Pacific, on the war against Japan, on D-Day, um, 
on things like the Battle of the Bulge, uh, campaigns obviously where the US fought in, decisive campaigns. Um, or Stalin is kind of more in the background. You know, he's an ally, he's a plucky ally. They know that he's fighting. And yes, during the war, of course, the US propaganda, uh, the pro-Stalin propaganda ramped up to an extreme degree where he was actually turned into sort of the pipe smoking Uncle Joe and Roosevelt's friend at uh, Tehran and to some extent at Yalta. Um, I mean, the story changed obviously over time after the onset of the Cold War and Cold War tensions, Stalin did begin to be viewed quite differently. Eventually, Americans did learn, uh, particularly uh, once literature started coming in the 80s and 90s about things like uh, the, the terror, about the famine, things that had been long either suspected or known about by connoisseurs, but hadn't really kind of percolated down into our general consciousness. But again, it's always been, it's always been variegated. I mean, even back in the 30s, there were many Americans who had heard about the famine, who had heard about the terror, and there were others who kind of denied their existence or said that, well, the show trials that Trotsky was probably guilty. I mean, there always have been communists, of course. There always have been sympathizers. Sympathizers. Um, it did seem that after the end of the Cold War, after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in 1991, it seemed like the story had shifted somewhat back to focus on Stalin's crimes while still admiring the, gallan, the gallantry and the bravery of, of the ordinary Russians who had suffered. We heard all about these kind of casualty figures. Um, but I do think in the end, there is this lingering sense of gratitude, uh, both in Britain and the United States. And some of that I think is warranted, again, not so much to Stalin personally, but to all of those Russian and Ukrainian and, and Central Asian and other soldiers in the Red Army who had fought and suffered and bled so horribly in the war. Uh, I think what makes it such a painful subject both to think and to write about is that so many of them, of course, were victimized by Stalin himself. I mean, you had those famous special section gunners behind the troops with machine guns in case they retreated or failed to advance, they might be killed by their own side. Uh, we know about the vast deportations of whole ethnies, of whole ethnic groups during the war, the Crimean Tatars, the Chechens, uh, Circassians and others, and the Volga Germans, ethnic Germans uh, behind the front line. We know about the suffering on the Eastern Front. Again, there, there's a kind of more simplistic version where it's simply the story of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. But of course, uh, uh, works like Bloodlands, for example, uh, by Tim Snyder, which came out about a decade ago, you know, we're pointing out really suffering on all sides of the lines, that a lot of this is kind of, you know, vendetta and score settling and ethnic and ideological tension. And, um, and the Jews might have suffered the most and, you know, the numbers might have been larger and the death camps kind of to some extent almost in another moral category because it was so systematic and brutal, the, the slaughter, the gassing, um, that of course behind the front lines with part Prisons, with reprisals, and then with the war that actually continues even after 1945, uh, all kinds of people, millions of people are losing their lives on the Soviet sides of the line. You have uh, you know, these millions of war prisoners, many of whom were put to work at backbreaking tasks in the Soviet gulag. Um, I don't think most Americans really appreciate all of those sides of the war. Um, and I mean, to the extent that they have a sense of, again, gratitude for the Soviet sacrifice. You know, I, think, I, think, I think that's absolutely fine. I mean, that's edifying. We should be grateful to those you know, who fought and died uh, defeat, to defeat Nazi Germany. But we should not forget, of course, the suffering of those who suffered at Stalin's hands either. Uh, nor even the fact that, I mean, this is one of the darker aspects to the story, which I do talk about in the book, uh, in recent years, people have talked about the suffering of Soviet war prisoners in, in German camps. Um, and that too is largely true. The death rate, the attrition rate was horrendous, perhaps as many as 57%, according to some estimates of, of Soviet uh, war prisoners actually died in German captivity during the war. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is that uh, the Germans, their allies actually tried to exchange prisoner lists and tried to have the Red Cross inspect some of these prisons on both sides of the Eastern Front. And it was the Soviets who actually refused. Stalin abjured. He saw his own uh, soldiers having been taken prisoners as enemies of the people, as we know. That is how they were treated under Soviet criminal code, uh, under Soviet law after the war. Uh, that's why so many of them did not want to be repatriated. That's why as many as a million and a half of them, the so-called Osttruppen, actually ended up fighting on the side of Nazi Germany in the war, even if the Germans didn't fully trust them, even if maybe a lot of them had joined really only to get better food racks. It's, it's an astonishing statistic. As many as a million and a half Red Army soldiers taken prisoner actually switched sides. And that's something very few people know about. Yeah, one of the, the lessons that I, I got from your new book and the one that I mentioned before, The Russian Revolution, um, was 
that maybe we didn't learn our lesson about communism. And it seems lately, I'm not saying we have more communists than we had before, because I feel like the word communism is not used very often. You use, you know, I'm a socialist, I'm a democratic socialist. And this is evident by what support for certain candidates for, you know, for president or whatnot. Um, and I think, especially maybe when you were growing up, there was, you know, you were still in the Cold War and that there was this, this, this feeling of maybe hatred, but, for, but definitely a dislike for communism. Um, are we too detached from that time now that, uh, that, that, that lesson doesn't apply anymore? And there are people maybe with arrogant, um, they have very arrogant opinions where they say, you know, if if maybe I instituted the, the uh, my own country and 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 communism under my rule would be better. When historically, I, I don't think that that works. But um, yeah, to my first question, do you think we've the, the word communism doesn't mean as much as it did maybe twenty years ago? Well, I certainly think for people who have grown up since the fall of the Soviet Union, who have no memory of the Cold War, really no memory of, of the great sort of ideological adversary of, of the United States and, and the West and NATO, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's lost a little bit of that um, that that sound, you know, that flavor of, of this kind of serious thing that we should either fear or at the very least take seriously. Um, the people don't have a living memory of it. Um, I think 20 or 25 years ago, perhaps maybe at, at its peak about 20 years ago when it seemed that the US was kind of the height of its power and prestige and Russia had really fallen down to these depths, both with the economic and industrial collapse. Um, and the US was kind of peaking around about the millennium, around about 2000. You know, there was the idea that, that communism's obituary had been written. You know, there was almost this sense of kind of goodbye to all that and good riddance and we don't have to think about it or worry about it anymore. Um, I do think people have now forgotten. Um, strangely enough, though, of course, we still have communist countries. Uh, there still are countries that are avowedly officially communist. Um, perhaps North Korea and China being the most emphatic about it as far as the rhetoric, um, even if China, to many extent, seems to have taken on the characteristics of a certain type of market or at the very least state capitalism, you still have a communist regime in power there with a system of censorship and social control, which um, in many ways is actually far more sophisticated and even, and even oppressive than that that the Soviets came up with in, in the times of the Cold War, even if, again, economically speaking, they might have abandoned certain aspects of what had the orthodox Marxism regarding the abolition of private property. Um, but I do think it's absolutely right that people have forgotten, that a lot of people have grown up without any sort of memory of this, um, having forgotten what it was like. This is true even in Russia, where there's a a huge revival really of, of Stalin's influence and popularity in recent years. Again, some of it probably one might call it almost a misplaced patriotism, looking at Stalin as the great victor in the war against fascism. And so Russians should revere him as just one of the greatest of their ancestors. Um, but it's amazing to me in light of how much we now know about, about Stalin, his rule, uh, the cruelty, the terror, the gulag, the victims, the, the Holodomor, as Ukrainians now call the kind of famine genocide of the early 1930s, the Second World War, the vast numbers of, of war dead, of civilian casualties, the labor camps, Camps, the deportations, uh, the deportations even in Asia after the war of Koreans and Japanese. Um, it's astonishing to me that, that Stalin has, has been rehabilitated to the degree that he has. I mean, a certain part of me understands. I mean, again, this is simply, he was the victor. He supposedly was the great nation builder, the, the greatest figure really in Soviet history. And so from almost this kind of raw instrumental perspective, I understand it. But I think it is, it is a a reminder that we do have to be careful. We do have to be on our guard. And you know, as you said, I think in, in the West, in the United States, even if perhaps the word communist isn't really used so much anymore, the idea that we have to fear status, those who want to erect these kind of very centralized systems of political control and, and censorship, um, it, it's, it's remarkable to me, for example, that, that a lot of people on the left of the United States now seem so much more at peace with the national security state, if you're talking about the spy agencies and surveillance and censorship, a lot of things that we used to associate with communism. I mean, when I grew up in the Cold War, 
uh, not everyone maybe agreed with everything the United States did around the world or with everything the CIA did around the world. In fact, that's one of the strangest things to me is seeing the way that the left seems to have embraced the CIA in recent years. But rather, there was this, this argument that at least a lot of people on both the left and the right agreed with in the Cold War period, that civil liberties were sacred, that our freedoms, our democratic freedoms, that freedom of speech, uh, freedom from government oppression and control, freedom from overweening censorship, um, perhaps the concern about central planning and, and a too large government role in the economy, that was probably more a concern of either libertarians or, or those a little bit on the, on the right politically. But even people on the left, I think in the Cold War period, they certainly agreed with the, the idea that we have to preserve our civil liberties against overweening government surveillance. Um, it's remarkable to me uh, how much of what I used to think is as that that kind of soft tissue or, or really in some ways the real essence of, of, of a free society, the idea that free peoples needed to maintain their freedom and preserve it against governments. Um, I do think those ideals are worth maintaining. And unfortunately, I do think they've, they've kind of been fallen by the wayside in recent years. And, and certainly since COVID, of course, we're now suddenly everyone seems to have accepted that governments have these vast powers over us yeah. to tell us what we can do. And we, we must get vaccinated or we must get tested or we must wear masks and we can't open our businesses and all the rest of this. I mean, so much of this to me smacks of a kind of a quasi communist system of social control. And, and I think it's remarkable that people have have gone along with it to the extent that they have. I mean, obviously people have protested and it's not as if everyone goes along with it and you have maybe different policies in different states. But you know, I think in a world where people still understood better the, the visceral danger of a kind of a, the imposition of communism, I think there might've been more resistance to, uh, to that type of top-down centralized statist control of our lives. Yeah, there, I think there would definitely be less blind trust almost uh, than there is now. Um, one of the interesting things that I found in your book about the Russian Revolution, I, uh, I actually took a class on the Russian Revolution in college. Luckily, I had a pretty decent professor. I, I read a wide variety of works. And um, one of the shorter ones was uh, Sheila Fitzpatrick's uh, The Russian Revolution. I think it's actually called The Russian Revolution. Um, I found it a little dry to read, but I mean, it got the point across pretty well. And the first one that I, 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 I was kind of blown away by because it was so readable was uh, Richard Pipes' uh, The Russian Revolution mm -hmm. as well. Um, I really enjoyed it. But the interesting thing, and I wanted to consult with you about this, uh, my professor, without using these words, but I'm going to paraphrase here, said when he went to the University of Chicago, um, as an undergrad and was studying the Russian Revolution. One of his professors said that Richard Pipes is a very good writer, but essentially he's full of shit, right? And to me, and because again, you're trying to study this subject, you trust your professor's judgment, that always stuck in my mind because as I was reading Pipes, I'm like, well, what's wrong here? Is there something that I'm not getting? Was he, are his facts off? I don't know. Um, so why, what was Pipes' impact on writing about the Russian Revolution? And uh, again, sorry for my language, but I, I assume you don't see Richard Pipes as full of shit, you know? Well, no, certainly not. I, I see why people have strong feelings about Pipes. Uh, in addition to being a scholar and a historian, he did briefly serve in the, the Reagan administration in the early 1980s as an advisor on uh, the Eastern, uh, the, the communist bloc, uh, particularly on Poland. It was in the days of solidarity. And, and, and Pipes himself was, of course, of, of Polish origin, actually Jewish Polish origin. Um, many of his relatives actually died in the Holocaust. Um, so he certainly had a kind of political stake history. Uh, um, but, you know, as Jewish descent, you, you, know, you might think if he had a sort of a bias, it might have been stronger against Nazi Germany. In fact, I think he was simply a scourge of all totalitarian regimes. Um, he certainly was not an apologist uh, for, for any of, of these awful regimes. He, he certainly had strong views. He wrote, he wrote with a kind of moral passion, I think, in part because, you know, to him, um, it wasn't simply history. Um, 
some of it was, for lack of a better word, you might say personal. I mean, you had a little bit of a personal stake in these matters. And Poland is, of course, a country that was famously divided up between Hitler and Stalin in 1939. Um, you know, his own family was kind of a direct victim of, of, of the molotov ribbentrop Pact in that sense, uh, you know, a little bit later of the Holocaust, but really, really just the erasure of, of Poland's borders uh, between these two overweening and brutal dictators. And so I think Pike certainly had a strong moral sense, a strong moral compass, and, and maybe some historians are comfortable with that. You know, they, they think one should be as, as neutral and detached as possible. Um, but as a scholar, of course, I mean, he was almost without peer. Uh, the amount of data he assembled for, for his, his research on, on the Russian Revolution, on, on that book published in 1990, reflected a, a career of work. Um, and he followed up with Russia and the Bolshevik regime, which didn't sell quite as many copies, but which was also influential. He was taken quite seriously at the time. I think some of what goes on with other historians, uh, you know, kind of disdaining Richard Pipes, uh, some of it might be politics. They didn't agree with the fact that, that he worked for the Reagan administration. Uh, some of it is, is, I think, partly jealousy. He got an immense amount of attention. Uh, his book was a bestseller and it came out with almost exquisite timing, just as the Soviet Union was falling apart. In fact, Pipes was literally called as an expert witness in what was supposed to have been a great Nuremberg style trial of, of the Communist Party convened by Boris Yeltsin's government. Uh, early in 1992, after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the failed putsch or coup of August 1991. In the end, they didn't really carry through with the trial and their different theories as to why or why not they did. Um, but he was taken quite seriously, uh, I think, by, by the Russians. And you now, as far as his work, um, you know, there, there are certain parts of the story he might have missed uh, because of the fact that he was known as, of course, a critic of the Soviet Union in the Cold War. They didn't let him into the Russian archives. So some historians might have said, well, look, you know, his work was not as archivally based as it might have been. That was both, I mean, to some extent, a badge of honor, I think. The only people they let in were the people who were willing to tell their preferred version of the story. Um, and we have learned a lot since Pipes' book came out. And so I think we definitely should pay attention to the scholarship that has occurred since then. Uh, but that said, many of his judgments have, have really borne out. I um, mean, you know, a lot of them on very controversial subjects, for example, regarding the, the German relationship with Lenin, uh, the German financial support for Lenin in 1917. Um, he did about as much research as he could on the, as he could on the topic. A lot of the, the important documentation is German, and he had full access to that. Um, now, as far as the Russian documentation, I mean, so much had already come out, both in secondary works and document collections and in memoir accounts in Russian language newspapers, periodical sources. Uh, he had access to plenty of information. Um, it is true that, again, he was not given access to the Russian archives during the Cold War, and so there might be some historians who, who resented for that reason, but I think it's mostly political, the fact that he both was a historian who also, to some extent, took sides in the Cold War and worked for the Reagan administration. I think there, there are some historians who probably uh, 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 disdain or re reject his scholarship, I think, for, for political reasons. Um, but I do think people took him seriously. I mean, his work was widely discussed. Uh, we learned an immense amount from that book. I think it's impossible to consider. A book that came out a few years after that, Orlando Feige's People's Tragedy, which also sold a lot of copies. Uh, I think Feige would be the first to admit. I mean, he, he learned vast amounts from Pipes' work. He probably couldn't have written the book he did without Pipes having kind of blazed the trail for him. And, and that's true for, for my own work as well and that of many other scholars inspired by Pipes. I mean, he, he pushed our work in new directions. He asked lots of questions, answered some, some he left kind of open and dangling. I think that's the best kind of scholarship, the best kind of a book that, that stimulates argument and, and, and future research. Certainly a lot of people have argued with the book. I mean, he got a lot of hostile reviews, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely not a work that, that I would dismiss. Yeah, and one of the things that you dispel in your book and uh, the Russian Revolution and uh, Richard Pipes did, and uh, I think maybe even Robert Conquest as well. What you did was dispel this theory that um, the proletariat rose up against the, you know, uh, against the bourgeoisie, and that's what led to the revolution. That's it, right? And it was all kind of to blame uh, on the czar and. But what I like about your book is you give a very kind of balanced approach to the czar and, you know, you uh, 
you say that you know he had faults of his own. He made certain tactical mistakes. Uh, actually, in some ways, way too many mistakes uh, that that gave Lenin the opportunity to you know get into power and and uh, but can you what wh why was history of the, uh, the the history of the Russian Revolution viewed in such black and white terms and as you say uh, that's you know there is a view that it brought peasants uh, quote uh, this is a direct quote peace land and bread and some view it as oppressive and indicative of why communism doesn't work. Well, I think it was inevitably going to be polarized. I mean, the, the Bolsheviks, obviously, they had their own rhetoric. You know, they, they claimed they were giving the people peace, land, and bread, um, that the revolution was about the overthrowing of, of uh, the oppressed, the, the, the class of the oppressors, the enemies of the people by, by the heroic proletariat. Um, you know, there are always all kinds of holes in, in, the, in the kind of the story, uh, beginning with the fact that they held elections in 1917 and 76% of the people are more voted against the Bolsheviks. So they obviously didn't have a democratic mandate. Most of the peasants voted for another party. They voted for Kerensky's party. In addition to the Tsar, Kerensky, of course, made his own blunders, which I talk about in the book. I mean, I think one, one way of putting this now is that I did try, I think, to, to dive a little bit deeper than, let's say, the earlier generation, uh, Pipes and Feiges and others writing at the end of the Cold War. They themselves had already problematized, as you say, or dispelled some of these, these old myths, the hoary or kind of Marxist language about simple proletariat and bur bourgeoisie. But even in their works, you get this sense of this kind of, you know, this corrupt, rotten regime that was just, uh, you know, worm-eaten and, you know, would topple over at the first blow, even if they didn't endorse the revolution and say that it led, of course, to, you know, peace, land, bread, and happiness, and so on. They, they still accepted that there was something about the czarist regime that, you know, that was rotten and that had to go. Um, one of the things I did discover, uh, again, despite all the political attack mistakes made by the czar, by all these liberal politicians, later Kerensky, the socialist revolutionaries, was that, in fact, morale in the Russian armies at the front was was not bad in the winter of 1916-17, and things like the rations that they were getting, and you know the food and all the rest of it, or or even just you look at, at Petrograd, although there were some shortages and their prices were certainly uh, shooting up for things like fuel and food. In fact, there weren't really shortages. There was a little bit of hoarding going on that the regime wasn't really falling apart at the seams, that a lot of what happened just kind of was this political dynamic that eventually got out of control. And then decisions made by the Tsar and his advisors, which turned out to be mistaken and perhaps fatal, um, that you know, there were different ways in which the Tsar could have either fought for his regime, he could have sent the the St. George's Battalion to restore order in Petrograd. And in many ways, I think he fell victim to his own honorable nature. That is to say, he didn't want to shed blood. He didn't want to be responsible for a, a massive bloody crackdown. And, and mostly he trusted his generals. They said that, that uh, the politicians they spoke to in Petrograd had things under control and so he should, he should call off the dogs. And it turned out they were utterly wrong. They had been lied to by these politicians, you know, who themselves were pretending to be masters of events that, that had really already kind of spiraled out of their own control. So there are elements of contingency and accident, elements of tragedy in the story. And I think the, those are the ones that I try to bring out, uh, both in the February and later in the October Revolution. Um, but yeah, to some extent, I mean, that old kind of more Sheila Fitzpatrick argument about the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, there are still a, a few unrestricted Un, unreconstructed Marxists who kind of talk that way about the revolution. Um, and, you know, th that version might come back. I mean, we're talking about how, to some extent, there is a little bit of a comeback um, among socialists and Marxists these days. Um, uh, I, I never really saw that type of explanation of events to be uh, plausible, but I think that's just because in the end, history is made by people and, you know, people can't be reduced so crudely to categories like that. Um, you know, in the, in the end, I think you have to just go back to the events themselves and go back to the individuals making the key decisions and to try to reconstruct what actually happened. And, and once you understand what happened, you also understand how it could have turned out differently. Yeah, uh, obviously, I, I, have a, I have too many questions to ask and, as always, not enough time, right? But uh, one of the last questions I ask of every guest, uh, can you recommend five books to the audience, it could be fiction or nonfiction on the topic that you write about or not, anything. Uh, sort of the Sean McMeekin essential reading list, if you can. 
um, five books or more. Feel free. Don't feel restricted. <laughs> we've, we've talked about uh, the Russian Revolution and Stalin's War, the Second World War. Um, uh, one, one book we've already talked about, I do think that Pipes' is Russian Revolution, I mean, it's kind of a landmark book. Um, I couldn't do without it. I mentioned Figes, his book, Peasant Russia, Civil War, if you want to understand what's going on in the countryside during the revolution, I think is, um, is really quite essential. Um, if you want to understand uh, some of the real intricacies of Russian politics in 1917. Um, uh, Leonard Shapiro did a great book on the Russian revolutions of 1917 and, and George Katkoff did a book, I mean, it's almost 50 years ago now, um, but where he, he dives into all kinds of complex subjects and both the personalities and the institutions and even some of the clubs and kind of unofficial societies that some of the, the key policymakers belong to. I think it's called simply Russia 1917, uh, that's really excellent. Um, oh, in the Second World War, I mean, the literature is absolutely massive, of course. Um, I mean, just for understanding kind of, I think Stalin, both personality and style of governance uh, during the war, I would start with uh, Simon Sebeck Montefiore's uh, Court of the Red Tsar, which is still essential reading. Um, as far as the war, I mean, the war on the Eastern Front, uh, Evan Maudsley did a, a reasonably updated book called uh, Thunder in the East, one of the first to really incorporate new research. Um, there are a lot of specialized books by uh, military historians such as David Glantz. Um, again, I, I wouldn't recommend any one book in particular as sort, sort of a must read. Um, but um, as far as um, foreign policy, again, it, it, it just depends on what what period in the war you're talking about. Um, there's a great book on Tehran called Turning Point that I highly recommend, uh, a book on Lend-Lease. Uh, it's a little bit dated now. I mean, I've updated in a lot of ways um, by Robert Hume Jones called Roads to Russia. I think that's absolutely essential reading on, on that subject. Um, uh, there are a lot of great new books. Uh, one book by SCM Payne called Wars for Asia that has a lot of new information about the Pacific War, about the Soviets in Asia. Um, now, as far as uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, um, again, the literature is just vast and, and you know, all the books have strengths and weaknesses. I, I wouldn't say there's any one a single book that I think is, is a must read on any, any of those subjects. I do say as far as general histories of the conflict, uh, you know, about just kind of the military history of the conflict, um, I think Anthony Beaver is, is tremendous. I mean, his books on Stalingrad, and fall of Berlin, uh, Berlin are well known. I think it's general history of the Second World War. Maybe I'll end with that simply because what I like about Beaver's work is that unlike a lot of other Second World War generalists, he is familiar with the Soviet sources and it really shows. Um, not just in his books on Stalingrad and the fall of Berlin, um, but on his books on the war generally. Um, that's something I think a lot of the, the more popular histories of, of the Second World War are missing. He understands the Eastern Front, he understands Soviet sources. Uh, so I do recommend uh, the, the books by Anthony Beaver. Wonderful. Um, so one more question. Oh, one, I want to say thank you for writing the books. Uh, the, the, the book on the Russian Revolution, I, I think maybe the highest compliment, if it means anything coming from me, but the highest compliment I could pay uh, a writer of history is to make it accessible and to make it readable. Because a lot of the times when you write about history, you could read very dry books and a lot of facts, facts, facts without any kind of plot line. And history to me is, it's a story. It should be read almost universally as entertaining in some ways, because it is interesting. And your book, books, sorry, uh, do do just that. Um, and if people want to follow your work, obviously they can, you know, they bought, can buy the books. Uh, is there something you're working on now? Obviously this book just came out, but is there something you're working on now and um, how can people follow your work? Um, well, I mean, of course, that's the main thing I have been working on, Stalin's War. Um, I, I have a couple of projects, none of which have quite clicked yet, but I, I do have an idea that I'm working on, but I, I, I can't actually reveal it yet in part because um, I'm, I'm just not that far along yet in the project. Um, but it, it certainly will be related to either uh, Soviet Union, communism, 20th century history, the Second World War. Um, 
Uh, those are the things that have been engaging me for most of the past two or three decades and they continue to engage me. So I think it'll be in that general area, but I, I can't give away more than that now. And, Got it. Um, but yes, I mean, my, my books are all available on, on Amazon from Barnes and Noble from all fine booksellers. And uh, uh, thank you for, for your kind words and uh, for having me on the program. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Yep, take care. <laughs>